Hi class. Um, so let's clear something up. So we have a hybrid class. So the hybrid class, obviously, in one school it means something else. In another school it means something else. Definition is completely something else. However, so in our school hybrid class it means that the entire class either have to be on site, on campus, or the entire class have to be online and I have to decide which days we were we will be online and which days we will be on site tests must be taken on site meaning the tests must be taken on the campus however I did request another option which is the high flags that will give us option maybe if they will be able to set up our rooms just because there's a lot of us they cannot find small rooms so um, if they will be able to accommodate our request however next lecture and maybe lecture after that we will be doing classes online so the next lecture and the lecture after maybe the lecture after is going to be completely online however I will post the information so I will let you know so for those who missed the class right so I have to record this lecture so I have to actually go through the lecture so um, here we are all right anatomy and physiology so there is anatomy and there is a physiology so the anatomy it is a study of a structure where the things are where the organs are so that's the anatomy structure of the body parts where they are physically located physiology is the study of the function of those body parts so here on the right uh, we're looking at the digestive system so the digestive system is one of the biggest system in the human body it has nine organs so where the organs are placed or where the organs are situated this is a anatomy how these organs relate one to another how these organs communicate and how they work one with another that would be physiology so physio is nature ology or logic is the study of something and pathology pathogen a bacteria a disease virus it's a study well pathology is the study of disease but patho pathogen pathogen is a virus or the bacteria so there are subdivisions in anatomy so gross or micro my, macro macro big micro small macro is big macroscopic anatomy the study of large visible structures the structures that we can actually see that we can ID regional anatomy as the name implies it it's a structure in a particular area of the body so that's the regional so if we're looking let's say at the clavicle that would be regional if we're looking at the heart it's a regional where they're located are system anatomy looks at one system so in human body we have 11 systems so looking at muscular system or looking at cardiovascular system nervous system endocrine system skeletal system and so on so there are 11 systems in human body uh, integumentary system, skeletal system, muscular system, cardiovascular system, nervous system, endocrine system. These are the hormones, regulatory molecules or substances. Uh, pulmonary system, uh, circulatory system, digestive system, urinary system, and reproductive system. Digestive system is one of the biggest system. It has a lot of organs and uh, integumentary system is one of the biggest organ in the body so it's like one organ our skin is organ one of the biggest organ and the uh, digestive system comprises a lot of organs it's actually nine organs together digestive system has five organs and the organs that help digestive system they are called accessory organs so there's plus four so it's nine you do not really need to know that i'm just stressing this information uh, surface anatomy uh, looks at internal structures internal structures as they relate to overlying skin like for example visible muscles or veins are seen on the surface so surface in a superficial area 
So under a complementary structure, function always reflects structure or function always relate to a structure. Levels of organization in the body. Please memorize this in this specific order, in this consecutive order. Atoms, molecules, and so on. So our body is able to use atoms, elements, and combine them into molecules. And then further, our body is able to take those molecules and make cells. Everything in human body happens on the cellular level. We're breathing because of our cells. When we're eating, digesting, absorbing food, and that energy gets into the cell, it is done on a cellular level. When there's a pimple or, or bump on our skin, it is basically on our cells. So everything happens on the cellular level. So when you know the levels of organization, it is very easy to pinpoint for a certain problem if we're looking for something. So out of a bunch of cells, our body is able to make a tissue. And then out of the tissue, our body is able to make an organ, one organ or multiple organs. And then when you take these organs and you put them together, here you go, organ system that comprises of a lot of organs, organ system. And then 11 organ systems stuck into one organism. You can also call an organism as a system. So we're all systems. I'm a system, you're a system, and our systems within another system on Earth, universe, planetary system, and so on. So humans have 11 systems, and those systems are comprised of multiple organs. But these organs are made out of the tissue and the tissue is made out of the cell and the cell is made out of the molecule and the molecules are made out of the atoms. Necessary life function. Uh, organ systems are designed to service the cell. Everything happens on the cellular level. So here's an example of how systems interact one with another. Here's a digestive system, respiratory system, urinary system, integumentary system, cardiovascular system. So there's a, a bunch of systems. This is just one example. So through respiratory system, we're breathing oxygen, right? We're breathing air. So our body is able to, out of the air, it takes oxygen. Um, and that oxygen ends up in the blood. So the, think of a blood as, as a highway. Through blood, we're able to deliver a molecule of oxygen or molecule that you are just absorbed into the blood by eating so let's say you're eating food like let's say you're eating bread right you're consuming bread your body separates or break down those big molecules separates them and then you are absorbing them into the blood once they're in the blood they need to get into the cell blood is a highway so that nutrient from the blood gets into the cell that oxygen from the blood gets into the cell so we deliver nutrients and oxygen to cells but then cells will release waste and then waste that is being produced by the cell from the cell from the cell let's say from the cell end up back in the blood and then from blood it could be excreted through the urinary system, for example, and that becomes a urine. Or something that your body is not able to digest, to break down, to absorb, put it in blood, that will become a waste. So something that your body is not able to digest or absorb will become a feces. So this is just a simple example on how those systems uh, communicate one with another. Maintaining of boundaries. It is important to maintain boundaries. So uh, an example of maintaining boundaries would be, let's say this is our blood vessel uh, or blood vessels and there's a cell and there's another cell and there's another cell and the cells make up organs. So boundaries, right? Everything has to be separated. Blood vessels have to have their integrity. Cells have to have their integrity. So there are cell walls. So that's a boundary. Separation between internal and external environment. 
So let's say this is the internal environment of the blood vessel and this is the external environment of the blood vessel. This is the internal environment of the cell and that would be the external environment of the cell. Skin separates organism from the external environment, boundaries. Responsiveness, ability to sense and response to stimuli. So in class I gave an example on uh, responsiveness, for example, if uh, you're touching, there is something hot. Let's say this microphone is hot. Uh, I'm touching that, right? It's hot. So I have to respond to that. So my body will respond by moving away from the stimulus. So I have nervous system uh, that will detect that it's hot, detects heat, and it will remove myself the entire body or just the part portion of the body from that stimulus so that's the response of uh, responsiveness um, with withdrawal reflex prevents injury there is a reflex arc in the nervous system we will dis discuss that so my muscles my bones my nervous systems all together working in tandem in order for me to stay away from this particular uh, environment um, control of breathing rate which must uh, change in response to different activities if it is less oxygen for example you will have more deep breathing right so you would want to grasp more air if you're exercising you need more air you need to get rid of more carbon dioxide <sighs> so your rate of breathing will be increased to get rid of carbon dioxide and to take more oxygen so this is the responsiveness uh, to particular stimulus metabolism all chemical reactions that occur in our body that's metabolism all chemical processes that happens in the human body it's metabolism and it includes catabolism and includes anabolism we will look at this in the next lecture lecture number two and excretion as the name implies is just a removal of waste from metabolism reproduction uh, not just a sexual reproduction but a cell division you have a cut right so then there is a stimulus there is a signal all right so uh, let's start making new uh, skin cells so that's the reproduction growth and repair uh, we age over time so some cells they die out and the new cells needs to arise right so with the proper stimulus with the proper signal there's a signal start building something new and uh, your body responds to that accordingly. Uh, at the organism level, reproduction is the production of offspring. At, at organism level. But in general, on the cellular level, it's just a division of cells for growth, for the repair. Old cell, there's a copy, and there's a new cell growth. And all old cells will die. They will kill themselves. It's actually a process called apoptosis. Apoptosis is a programmed cell death. Our cells are programmed to kill themselves. Well, first they will reproduce, right? They will, your body will make a new cell and then the old cell will die. Growth is just increase in size of a body part of an organism. So, so what is homeostasis? Body's maintenance of internal balance. That's an equilibrium. And that's in the homeostasis the equilibrium homeostasis when all of the systems are in balance 11 systems and they functioning together homeostasis is the maintenance of relatively stable internal conditions despite continuous changes in the environment if you are outside and it's 90 plus degrees outside let's say today and you're getting hot your body's response would be to start evaporating to get getting rid of uh, that heat or your sweat cells will start producing sweat in order to cool off your skin to cool off your body uh, so that's the responsiveness however we're gonna use a one classical example that it re that it relates to homeostasis there's actually two classical examples 
So a dynamic state of equilibrium always readjusting as needed. Regulation of temperature, regulation of blood glucose. If it's too loud outside, what will your response be? You will use your limbs and you will cover your ears. So it's a responsive uh, action. If it's a flash, if it's too bright, your response would be to close your eyes. So that's the response to the stimulus. If you're touching something hot, my microphone is hot, it is hot microphone, so the microphone is hot, you will remove yourself from that environment. So that's a response as well. Uh, and there's a, a lot of organs, they work together. Your brain is controlling all that. So your brain becomes a control center. We have sensors that sensing the environment. We have a control center that communicates with your sensors or your sensors communicate to your control center. And our control center has to respond to the external environment that has been sensed by sensors and that there is a factor. The factor is a group, let's say group of muscles that will remove my body part from that environment. Again, if this is hot and I'm touching this, the factor would be group of muscles that will move my hand away from the stimulus. That's an factor. So let's look at uh, those two classical examples. And you see, maintained by contributions of all organ systems, because all, uh, all of the organ systems, they work in tandem in order to sustain this equilibrium, to be in homeostasis. But it must constantly be monitored and regulated to maintain homeostasis. And it's maintained homeostasis based on these three principles. Sensing, controlling, and the factor. So first we're going to use temperature, then I'm going to use blood glucose. So this one, uh, this is a, one of the classical example. Negative feedback keeps body conditions within a normal range by reversing any upward or downward shift. And there are also regulated variables. And the regulated variables must be kept within a narrow range, which is called the set point. So let me explain that somewhere else. Uh, let me go here. So the classical example is a thermostat. So let's say the temperature in the room is 72 degrees of Fahrenheit. And it is a normal temperature. You just set this thermostat in your room to this temperature. And that's your comfort zone. So when the temperature is increased, let's say to a 73, I want to use red, to the 73 degrees of Fahrenheit, right? It becomes hot. But you just set your thermostat to the temperature of 72. So this is your set point. Then you have sensors. Sensors, ah, uh, well, sensors, Let's say this would be a sensor, right? This is a cell and this is a sensor. So let's say if it's a thermostat, sensors, they detect that the temperature was increased and then there should be a response. So HVAC system, ventilation, air conditioning system will start blowing cold air so it can decrease this temperature back to your set point, back to 72, and the HVC shuts down. The reason HVC shuts down because you just programmed this thermostat to get to this point, to reach 72, right? Otherwise, HVC would be continuously uh, blowing cold air and the temperature will go to 71, but that's not your set point. You just set it to 72. That's normal condition. So in our body, in human body, we have similar set points. Let's say you're consuming food. After the consumption, your blood glucose will be increased. So let's say this is a set point. Set point of blood glucose, of certain levels of glucose being in blood. So if this is a threshold, this is normal, let's say this is normal, 
So set point is the normal, it's homeostasis. Set point is equilibrium. Let's say for some reason your blood glucose is high. We have an organ, pancreas, that releases hormone insulin and insulin insulin is a hormone that decreases blood glucose if the glucose is increased in our blood your pancreas detects that your body is out of the set point that your body is out of the normality that your body is out of the equilibrium that your body is out of the homeostasis because blood glucose is supposed to be here but it's right there so the insulin being secreted by the pancreas and the insulin is supposed to lower blood glucose. So in normal healthy body, insulin will be released and supposed to decrease blood glucose. So the blood glucose will reach its set point. Once it reaches the set point, there should be a negative feedback. A negative feedback would be a signal to pancreas, stop releasing insulin. I just did what you asked me to do. I just decreased the blood glucose to a normal set point. If the negative feedback is destroyed, for some reason, if the negative feedback is broken, there is no actual callback and the pancreas will be constantly sending insulin and will be constantly decreasing blood glucose below that original set point and if the glucose will drop very, very low, person can die when there's a metabolical disorder in the body where everything is not functioning how it's intended so the set point we have different set points for different systems and the negative feedback it is when it does the opposite when it decreases the stimulus positive feedback it's when it's constantly increases the stimulus so the control center it is an organ that controls particular pathway sensor sensors right each cell has its receptors and they sensing the environment and the factor is the group of muscles or group of other systems that will increase or decrease certain stimulus variables let's say blood glucose the vari variables that could be changed body temperature temperature could be increased temperature could be decreased blood volume could be increased could be decreased depends on the blood pressure if our blood vessels will constrict the blood pressure will go high if our blood vessels will relax the blood pressure will drop let's say sodium too much of sodium sodium keeps water too much of water together with sodium blood pressure goes high so the systems will react the factors will react in order to get rid of water so we can drop blood pressure if the blood pressure is too low we will keep water instead of urinate so the blood pressure will go high so these are the factors these are the variables now static control of variables receptors right they're sensing the environment control center and the factor so these are the three components of a negative feedback positive feedback response enhances or exaggerates the original stimulus so let's say you have a laceration you have a cut and we have a blood platelets blood platelets constantly circulate our system they are there on purpose to make a clot or to make a plug to clot this particular injury so they aggregate around this injury area so when there is an injury our system will enhance this particular stimulus by releasing even more of platelets so if it's huge cut then your body will be exaggerating enhancing the release of platelets so they will clump so they will aggregate so you can close that particular wound usually positive feedback is not working or the negative feedback is not working because we have metabolic disorder Metabolic disorder is one of the most dangerous disorder in human body. So what I do suggest to visit this site, that's my website, please read about metabolic disorder. So in class, we didn't really go over that because I want you guys to print this out and for the next week or two weeks before we'll get into the skeletal system 
to go over all of the terminology. Please remember, memorize as much as you can. On this slide and on this slide, it's pretty much the same thing. Maybe there's some names are a little bit different. Maybe there's addition, but most of it here. It is important to know that. So everything is being looked at in anatomy and physiology from the anatomical pos uh, position. So this is anatomical position, anterior view, with feet being situated like that and palms up, right? Well, in class it was a lot easier for me to show, but you're standing like that with your palms facing forward. So this is an anatomical position. Even if the person is going to be laying down on the table, so it's still going to be an anatomical position. Why? Because it's easier for healthcare professionals, whoever doing anything on, on the body, when they're writing something, recording something, everything would be described from anatomical position. So, for example, if you're creating, a, you're creating an incision, for example, you're going from top to bottom, you do not say I'm going from top to bottom, you're using particular terminology, using particular terms. And that's what we're going to discuss right now. So, cephalic, it relates to our head. So there's orbital, there's uh, nasal cavity, orbital cavity, nasal cavity, oral cavity, buccal, there are muscles, bucinator, it's the buccal, our cheeks, uh, mental, our chin, cervical region is our neck, so that's the cervical region, uh, thoracic region, it's our chest, our thorax, uh, has a sternum breastplate, auxiliary underarm pits, memory, that's where the memory glands, abdominal area, umbilical, that's where the umbilical cord is, uh, pubic area, sexually reproductive organs where are, so it's a pelvic area or the pubic area, there's another name for that, inguinal or groin, uh, acromial region, it's right here. When we're going to look at the skeletal system, it's going to be a lot easier to look at that where the acromion is. Brachial region, so that's the arm, upper arm, brachial, upper arm. Anticubital, that's the cubital area. That's where the blood has been drawing. Anticubital, brachial, antibrachial. So this is the upper arm, which is the brachial, brachial and this is a forearm. So the forearm is antibrachial. So this is a brachial and this is the antibrachial. Carpal, that's our wrist. So when we say hand, it's not the entire limb, it's upper limb. But hand is this. That's the hand. That's, that's it. Not the entire thing. Not these three parts. Upper, forearm, or this. So this is a brachial upper arm, this is a forearm, and this is a hand. This is a wrist. Again, when we look at the skeletal system, it is very easy to distinguish one from another. This is our palm. These are our digits. This is a thumb. And the name for the thumb, thumb is pole, polex. Just think of a pole, polex. Easier to remember. Another name for the hand is a manus. Um, not being used a lot, but it's, the name is at manus. Palmer and digits not the fingers but digits so digits uh palm and this is wrist right three body parts lower limb is broken down also in uh, in the segments so the coxal when we're gonna look at the skeletal system if it's easier to actually look at the coccyx area so the coxal is a hip femoral that's our thigh Popliteal, that's where the patella is, the kneecap. Cruller, front of the leg or this part of the leg. Lower leg, right? So this is a cruller. Or uh, sural, right? Calf, the back of it, right? Cruller is the front, let's say, and sural is the back. Uh, fibular on the side. Perineal not being used a lot. Tarsal are angles, but that's the region of the tarsals. And then the metatarsals, again, it's easier to look at, uh, at the skeletal system. And fingers or toes, right? But we call them also digital. As in our hand, they are digital. And in our foot also are digital. So altogether, this region is called a paddle foot. 
and the big toe is a hallux or hollux. Um, olecranon, that's a elbow, olecranon, um, femoral thigh, popliteal, back of the knee, calcaneus, that's the heel, and the plantar, plantar, sole of our foot, lumbar, the back region, thorax, lumbar, cervical, thorax and the lumbar lower again in the skeletal system it would be more precise it would be a lot easier to learn this terminology in the skeletal system however please get familiar with that because when we're going to get to the skeletal system and if this is going to be in your mind do walking around with the printout for two weeks and just looking casually trust me you will remember it like that because information will be build up build up build up and build up Sacral, again, it's easier to look at the skeletal system. Gluteus, butt cheeks. Uh, perineal, it's between the anus or and external genitalia. Not been used that a lot. Vertebral, it's where the vertebral column, where the spinal cord. Again, it's easier to look at the skeletal system. Um, so, and scapula, it's the back, uh, back of uh, upper upper limb. So here is uh, pretty uh, similar terminology, it's just extra here, like iliac, it's the hip, hip bone. So please, print out this one, print out this one. Skeleton, you see it's color coded, it's like uh, gray or silver, I'm colorblind, and this is yellow. So everything that is in this color is the axial skeleton, head, neck, and the trunk. And everything that is in yellow is appendicular skeleton appendicular upper limbs and lower limbs together with hip bones so appendiculars they are attached to the axial skeleton so directional terms so when we describe a body part or the entire body we have to look at the directional term like an address right on the map so anything that starts from the top is a superior anything that is below it is inferior so we're going inferiorly or from the bottom going up we're going superiorly so this is a superior to this part of the body but this part of the body is more superior to this part of the body this part of the part of the body is more superior to this part of the body and so on right so head is a superior to a chest and chest is the superior to a trunk and trunk is a superior to air lower limbs and so on or your foot is inferior to a your chest and your chest is inferior to your head so also there is a proximal and distal so proximal it is the beginning of an organ or a structure and the distal it is the farther away part of the organ or the structure so my shoulder is proximal to my elbow but my elbow is distal to my shoulder right my elbow is proximal to my wrist but my wrist is distal to my elbow if I'm standing in anatomical position with my I was, right with my hands pointing this way right I'm standing like this with my hands pointing that way so my wrist is proximal to my digits but my digits are distal to my wrist here on the right you see this hand is upside down it's not in anatomical position I did this on purpose but let me flip this right so now it's in anatomical position so the carpals or the wrist is proximal to my digits so when you're describing these digits are not proximal to the wrist because if we look from the anatomical position with hands facing down and palms looking at you right so the wrist would be wrist carpal bones would be proximal to digits so if we look at the digestive system because there's a lot of organs and it's very easy to look at that so let's say liver liver is proximal to a stomach 
but stomach is distal farther away to a liver. Why? Because this is the beginning, that's the superior region, and we're going down, that's inferior. But my stomach is more superior to small intestine, or my stomach is proximal to my small intestine, and the small intestine is distal to my stomach, or more inferior to a stomach. I'm not trying to uh, confuse you, but that's what it is. Another thing is midline that splits the body in two equal parts. Not necessarily equal, but it's midline in two equal parts. So there's a midline and there's a lateral. If I will draw a vertical line like that, right? That's the midline. Splits body in two halves. So if I'm describing a sternum, sternum is the breastplate in the middle. If I'm making a cut here and I'm going from medial to the side, I'm going laterally. I'm going lateral to the side. And again, if you look here, right, I'm going from midline, I'm going to the lateral side, to the outside. So if I'm standing in an anatomical position and I'm facing with my uh, hands this way, my pinky is towards medial line but my thumb pollux is towards to the lateral side so my pinky is medial bone and my thumb is lateral bone so if I'm going from medial towards this way I'm going laterally but if you're describing hand and you're describing this organ just this organ so this would be lateral bone, this would be a medial bone. Great example, if you will look at these bones here, the bones of the hand. This bone and this bone. So a radial radius and an ulna. So this bone radius and this bone is ulna. So the ulna is a medial bone because it's closer to a medial line and the uh, radius, this further away bone, is a lateral bone because it is outside on the lateral side. If I would be describing this position, again, I would be describing from anatomical position facing you. So still, this bone would be medial and this bone would be lateral. Still the same bones, right? Radius and ulna. Radius would be lateral and ulna would be medial same as here also there is a anterior or ventral front and there is a posterior post in the back or dorsal like a door door in the back so the posterior and dorsal it is a back anterior and ventral it is a front so this is a dorsal view this is dorsal or posterior view and this is a ventral or anterior view so planes of division sagittal plane it is a midline midline the midline right separates a body into left and right side in two halves to the midline so the another name for that is a sagittal line or there is another name mid sagittal line mid sagittal plane there's also horizontal plane or transverse plane so the transverse or horizontal plane that separates body part into two halves as well doesn't really have to be equal parts the transverse plane could be here or here so it separates body in two parts doesn't really have to be equal parts but it's a horizontal plane and there's a frontal plane so the frontal plane uh, separates body into the ventral and into the dorsal side this is a frontal plane frontal plane or coronal plane that's another name for that you see this line goes vertical but it's not the midline because it's, it's a lateral view we're looking from a side looking from the side is the lateral view looking from the front it is the anterior view looking at the back it is a posterior view so and it depends on the view if you see the line 
you have to start imagining the planes of division. So that's the frontal line. And the frontal line starts right at the back of the ear. And the name of that otic, that the ear is otic. I actually wanted to mention that right here, otic. That's the ear, otic. So the frontal plane does not start here, but it starts here, right? And it goes like that. So the parasagittal plane, it is when there is a cut off center. So when you're creating sagittal line, but not exactly at the, at here, at the midline, but let's say you would go vertical right here. It would be mid-sagittal. If, you, if, you, if this is the body part, right, and that's the front view, let's say, right, instead of going this way, right, you're creating cut like this, not directly in the midline. So that would be parasagittal. There, there is another, there's another name for midline, mid-sagittal or sagittal line. You see, it's vertical. It is a longitudinal vertical. Oblique section doesn't really have to be 45 degrees. Could be any angle. Could be boom, 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 any type of angle. So you see this frontal plane. Why it's frontal plane? Because it's a lateral view. We're looking from a from the side or the side view. In, uh, like in math or geometry, it would be side view or in mechanics, but in anatomy and physiology, it is a lateral view from the side. So you see this line goes vertical, right? So it separates body into ventral front and into dorsal back body parts. But there are cavities. Cavities, we have a lot of cavities in human body that houses organs. So Everything in yellow pertains to dorsal cavity. And dorsal cavity has cranial cavity and uh, vertebral cavity. So the cranial cavity, that's where our brain, the entire brain, regardless of this line. And the spinal cord, ventral cavity. So the reason they do not separate this in two because it would be uh, useless, right? So it is easier, they decided, whoever created that, they decided that that cranial cavity be, be, uh, belongs to dorsal cavity instead of saying that cranial cavity belongs to, belongs to ventral cavity. Everything that is in red belongs to ventral cavity, front. So that includes thoracic cavity, our thorax, our lungs, our trachea, uh, our heart, lungs, heart, blood vessels in thoracic cavity. And it's being separated by a diaphragm. It's just a big, huge dome-shaped muscle that helps us to breathe in, breathe, breathe in, and breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. The reason I'm showing the opposite direction, because when you're breathing out, this um, diaphragm muscle becomes like a dome shape so it's pushing on our lungs to get rid of carbon dioxide so but when i'm breathing in that muscle relaxes becomes more straightened so the lungs can have more space to open up to get more air so that diaphragm separates thoracic cavity from abdominal cavity so the abdominal cavity houses a lot of organs. So abdominal cavity houses all of these organs. Liver, stomach, pancreas in the back, spleen, large intestine, small intestine. In the back there are kidneys. And then there is another, another cavity, is a pelvic cavity. Or we can call it together abdominal pelvic cavity. You see, abdominal pelvic cavity. So abdominum and the pelvic cavity so abdominal pelvic cavity but if you look here you see this lung is separated from heart so there's abdominal organs separated from pelvic all of the organs are housed in its own membranes there is a membrane it's a tissue that houses organs to separate them we need membranes to separate them one organ from another organ so nothing can penetrate so thoracic cavity cavity is broken down into plural or pluri plural it is a lung or lungs and cardial it is a 
it is a heart so the pericardial it is around the heart so when we refer to organs we can collectively call them viscera so all of the organs together are collectively called viscera so thoracic cavity has plural cavity so the plural refers to a lung and cardial or pericardial cavity refers to a heart so the plural cavity lungs and uh, pericardial is a heart but each cavity is separated by its own serosa membrane so let's look at this membrane so you see on this image there's like ribs right the rib cage so each organ surrounded by a double membrane layer so the lung surrounded by the membrane and then in the middle there is a fluid is called serous fluid and then there is another membrane so think of it as like oral cookie right so the oral cookie let me use black and white so that's the oral upper portion that's the bottom portion i'm gonna use yellow right and that's the sweet part one side of the membrane this is another side of the membrane and this is serosa or serosa fluid so why there is a fluid it serves as a cushion to protect organs or so the organs can slide against one another that's one side of the membrane that's another side of the membrane and this is yellow fluid right so this and this would be parietal pleura and this side that is closer to an organ it is a visceral because visceral equals organ so viscera viscera equals organ right so that's why it's called visceral pleura pleura it is a lung and it is a visceral pleura or it is a visceral pericardium organ which organ cardium pericardium parietal pleura it is around the chest wall and parietal pericardium it is around the other organs that outside which is the lung on this side and on this side so that's why this side is called parietal pericardium and this one is called visceral pericardium because it's closer to to the heart for the lung it is a parietal pleura on this side and on this side it is a visceral pleura i know it could be confusing but the fluid in between it is a serous fluid so but the membrane it is a thin double layered membrane that covers surfaces in a ventral cavity right ventral frontal cavity parietal what is important parietal serosa around internal body cavities wall and the visceral it is a closer to an organ so this would be a visceral membrane and this would be a parietal membrane or pericardial membrane and there is another peritoneum that refers to abdominal pelvic cavity all of them together peri around tonium abdominal pelvic so all of the membranes uh, all of the cavities that are in abdominal pelvic region so if there is a damage to membrane regardless of the organ uh it is very dangerous because if there's a pathogen or there's a laceration or there's a gun wound or there's a knife wound so if this membrane is damaged the fluid starts leaking out and there's opening and the pathogen or the bacteria can enter and get to an organ so these membranes they protect these organs from the external environment so the integrity of the membrane is crazy important so peritonitis peri to nitis it is inflammation ITS ITIS it means it's inflammation suffix ITIS it is inflammation anything you add in front pr 
prefix, but the suffix ITS, it is inflammation. So the peritonitis, it is inflammation of the membrane that surrounds all of the abdominal pelvic uh, organs, and it's very dangerous. This you do not need to know. There's like nine parts, right? Like this, nine quadrants. So all you need to know this four quadrants, and it's pretty simple. Upper left, upper right, lower left, and uh, lower right quadrant. That's all. And there are other body cavities. So there's orbital openings, right? Orbital cavity, nasal cavity, and oral cavity. And there's also middle ear cavity. So uh, this was the lecture for chapter number one, and the chapter number two is coming because also in today in class we started chapter chapter number two, uh, chemistry. So uh, it will be coming soon.